Let's review by considering a different example of when S content is useful. S content, remember, it's a little misleading the way I put it. E content, S content, O content. Actually, there's a variety of E contents because what I call it E content if there's anything that is left so that you're putting a condition on the episode. Uh, so even if maybe you know the time but you don't know the subject, e-content. Maybe you don't know the time or the subject, e-content. Uh, once you get all the values, the subject, the time, the representation filled in, uh, then you're really, the, the truth conditions don't put a demand on the episode anymore. Truth puts a demand on the episode, but the truth conditions you're getting at, the particular inus conditions you're getting at, don't get to the episode, they just say what kind of objects need to fill the roles that the representation of the episode gives rise to, given the subject of the episode and the time of the episode as arguments. Well, maybe you have some of the S roles filled in, it's still S content, because you're still putting a demand on, on the subject and the time in terms of they have to be such that the S rules get to arguments of a, uh, get to values of a certain type. Uh, <coughs> so here's putting S content to work. Very familiar example. I, I, I first uh, uh, modified it to, to have to do with the Basque country. So then I thought, oh, no, that's not a very good idea if I give a lecture in the Basque country and talk about spies and Bolsheviks. We'll all be arrested by the Spanish government. And I probably shouldn't have even said that, should I? <laughs> so we'll just go back to Ralph and Ortcut. So Ralph is at the beach with his pal Waldo, who's an FBI agent. And uh, he sees Ortcut dressed in a Speedo. And of course, you don't usually see your neighbor dressed in a Speedo, so he doesn't recognize that the person he sees in the Speedo, you know what a Speedo is in Europe, don't you? Yeah, I mean, um, is, uh, is his neighbor Ortcut. But this fellow is taking uh, files out of a big bag marked CIA secrets and handing them to an obvious Bolshevik. And so... Ralph thinks, that man is a spy. Now the, uh, the S content requires that the person who feel, fills the that man role for Ralph at that time is a spy. He also thinks, maybe Waldo thinks he recognizes Ortcut and says, isn't that Ortcut? And Ralph says, oh, no, Ortcut is not a spy. And the S content requires that Ortcut, I forgot a not there, Ortcut not be a spy. So the O content, that is what you get if you fill in the values of the subject object roles are contradictory. Ortcut is a spy, Ortcut is not a spy. But the S contents are consistent. Worlds in which Ortcut is uh, uh, worlds in which the value for the Ortcut role relative to Ralph at T is not a spy, and yet the that man, value for the that man role is a spy. Genoveva was surprised at my free and easy use of worlds, possible worlds. Quite rightly, I don't much like possible worlds. Uh, in, primarily because, um, well, I don't know. It's not that I dislike possible worlds. I don't think there are any possible worlds in Lewis's sense, and I really don't think there are possible worlds in most other senses either, in, a, in that they have to be um, some kind of object that determines everything that happens, because I don't think there's a totality of facts. Matter of fact, I don't think there is even a world in the sense in which our world would have to be a world to be one of the possible worlds. But, on the other hand, I just completed 
with Wes Holliday, a brilliant young Stanford student, now an assistant professor at Berkeley, a wonderful article on epistemic logic based on roles and worlds. So maybe worlds aren't so bad after all. Um, Okay, now, now we'll uh, look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, what seems to be a severe problem which is related to historical issues about the self and the now. Suppose Elwood sends me an email. I'm going to bed now. So I get the email a few minutes later or maybe the next morning. I can supply a mode of presentation for the time. Now do I have to, when did he go to bed? Well, he went to bed at the time he referred to as now. What time did he refer to as now? Well, the thing that played the, the time that played the now role relative to the subject in the time. And who was the subject in the time? Well, the subject was Elwood, and I can look on my Gmail up at the corner, it says when the mail was received, and it's pretty instantaneous, so I can say, ah. Now, with the subject Elwood and the time 1103, stands for 1103, give or take however few seconds it takes the mail to arrive. So I seem to be able to think the thought, Elwood went, I seem to be able to arrive at an O content. But how does Elwood think of T? I mean, if I couldn't fill in the subject in the time, I wouldn't have been able to refer to a time with, uh, 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 as the time that Elwood went to bed or said he went to bed. I, I could have quantified it there's some time such that the subject, but I, but I had a way of thinking of Elwood and a way of thinking of the time, 1103 and T. But how about Elwood? How did he think of T at the time? So it's 1103. He writes, I'm going to bed now. He doesn't refer to a time unless there's some value for the subject in time of his use of now. The subject isn't relevant, but I just... So how is he thinking of the ta time that is the argument for the function that now gives us, that takes us to the same time? Well, he might have been thinking of it as 11.03, but that's not quite right, because when you use now, you, you, I mean, then he would have been thinking of now the way I was thinking of now the next morning when I saw that he sent it at 11.03. So he's not thinking of now as the uh, value for the now function with the argument 11.03. He's got to be thinking of it in some much more intimate and immediate way for it to really to be what's going on when you use now to refer to the present time. Um, and even if he thought it was 11.05, if it was 11.03, he would have referred to 11.03. So, so what's going on? Well, maybe, you know, the obvious way to refer to now is now. So maybe he refers to the input time as now, or he thinks of the input time as now, or his mode of representation of the input time as now. But now we've got, now we've got a, a bit of a regress, because to think of the input time as now, he seems to need a temporal argument for the now function, and how is he going to think of that as now? Now this is just the point that Marcus, is Marcus here? Or did he go, or am I thinking of Marcus? Who am I thinking of? Not Marcus. Um, Simon. Simon here? Anyway. Simon has made an infinite regress back to wherever he's from. St. Andrews, right? Okay. So how does Elwood think of the time of the episode when the episode is Elwood's thinking now? And the same problem with I and its associated role, uh, identity, you know, I of XT, which gives you X. 
I can identify to whom Elwood referred to, to whom El Elwood referred to, seemed to have an extra two in there, to whom Elwood referred with his use of I, because I know that the value of I x t is identity, I can identify the relevant argument as Elwood. But how did Elwood identify himself as a relative argument in his episode of the use of I? Well, <clears throat> suppose Elwood, as a longtime admirer of Francois Recanati, and uh, then after a long period of, uh, of uh, you know, mental illness and, and overuse of drugs, gives completely into the fantasy that he actually is Francois Recanati. So if, if you said, who wrote Mental Files, he would say, I did. Beautiful book, isn't it? And um, so he sends me a message and says, I'm going to bed now, sincerely, Francois Reconati. Now, I will think wrongly, since I don't know very much about Elwood's recent mental problems, that for reasons that are hard to explain, Francois has sent me a message telling me he's going to bed. Uh, that is, I will take the argument of the SO role I, XT, to be Reconati which is wrong. And so will Elwood. You say, Elwood, you say, Elwood what, is, <laughs> what is the value of the subject-object role associated with the English first person in your use of it? And he would say, Francois Reconati. But he isn't referring to the value of France that you get with the argument Francois Reconati, he's referring to the value that you get with Elwood. I mean, he's wrong that he's Francois Reconati. He refers to Elwood and says something false about him when he says, I am Francois Reconati. So how, what is his mode of presentation for the argument that he seems to need in order to get to the value namely himself. Well, you're going to say, well, the natural way to think of yourself is I, but that's going to lead to the same regress. Now, for the view I've been advocating, this is a, a, a severe problem because it has not just to do with self-knowledge and knowledge of what time it is, but with all knowledge because, not all knowledge, but any knowledge where, where the subject-object role is, is, is is, is significantly sensitive to the arguments. Because it seems like the person will have to identify to, 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 <coughs> to think of Aristotle, the philosopher, uh, I need to be the input into the Aristotle subject-object role uh, because facts about me are pertinent, that is, which, uh, which uh, which name notion network I'm trying to exploit. And so it's not just that I, we have a problem about self-knowledge, it's a problem about Aristotle knowledge. And of course, that for a philosopher, that's even more severe. Um, that's a joke, Kepa. Why aren't you laughing? Anyway. Um, well, we, we, could, we, could, uh, we could solve it with a phrase, say, self-attribution. Say, ah, oh, well, you're self-attributing. Uh, the property of going to bed at 7 o'clock. But, I, I, you know, I, I mix feelings about Lewis's view. Uh, I think the terminology has been a disaster. Uh, in, the, in, in the in the in the re previous workshop, the term they say belief was used a lot. And it was usually used just to mean beliefs about oneself. But that's not what Lewis meant by they say belief. Uh, if you look it up on scholarly sources like Wikipedia, it's typically defined as knowledge about oneself or from a perspective. But those are two quite different things. Right? If I see a tree and I say that's a fir tree, that's knowledge from a perspective. The perspective of someone is looking at the tree, but it's not a belief about myself. If I say, I am taller than Meg Ryan, that's a belief about myself, 
Yes, I'm fixated on Meg Ryan. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's a belief about myself, but it's not from a perspective. I have no idea where Meg Ryan is right this minute. She could be in the room. Maybe she's fixated on me, too. Attends all my lectures in disguise. But I don't think so. Uh, she could be in an airplane over the Basque Country. Uh, she could be asleep in uh, Los Angeles or wherever she lives. So the terminology has been a bit of a disaster. And I think self-attribution is pretty misleading too because it, 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 uh, it elides the case we're thinking about uh, that arises with this problem. That's what he intended he, uh, to be getting at. Uh, and the case uh, uh, where, 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 <coughs> uh, so, I'll come back and say why well, I think it's misleading after I talk about the chicken but, and the mirror test. Um, but still, I thought Lewis ex got something right, which he borrowed from me, but I think clarified up to the point he started talking about centered worlds. Uh, namely, that there is, there is something involved that's property-like, in an episode of knowledge or belief. He called that the object of belief. I don't know what an object of belief is. I would call it the, the meaning of the representation or the character of the representation or the role provided by the representation. But enough of that. Now I'm going to try to solve this problem by using some ideas from Dretzky and teleosemantics, I think it's called. These ideas also go back to my book with John Barwise called Situations and Attitudes. Um, humans and other animals have special ways of finding out about their environments. Uh, we have extraoception. These are real words. <laughs> uh, we can see, hear, touch, and smell what is going around us, on around us, and we can taste what's in our mouth. So we can find out about the external world or the, the the, the, the part of the world that isn't quite external because it's inside our mouths, um, using perception. Then we have interoception for what's going on in our internal organs. There's other names for that. And then we have proprioception, which I usually misspell, but I think I got it right there, for the positions and movements of our limbs, sometimes called kinesthesis, I think. And then some of us have introspection, some humans at least, probably other animals too, for what's going on in our minds. So we have ways of finding out about what's going on around us and in us. We're equipped by nature with such things. And, and this ability goes very deep. Uh, this is Dretzky's example. The subspecies of a certain kind of seagoing bacteria that live in the northern hemisphere have internal magnets that point to magnetic north. This is called magneto, it's called something, magnetotaxis, 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 magnetotaxis. <laughs> the, the bacteria automatically swim in that direction towards magnetic north. Now the earth is curved, so if you're in the sea and you swim directly north, you actually go deeper. And that's very good for them because they want to get away from oxygen. And the deeper you go in the sea, the less oxygen. So given the nature of the bacteria and of the northern hemisphere, the roles of being magnetic north and being the direction of beneficial swimming are linked. They're not linked in the summer southern hemisphere. Uh, so the bacteria there uh, have evolved differently. If you took some northern hemisphere bacteria and put them in the summer southern hemisphere, you would have paid a lot of money to see them die. Um, so here the agent and the time of the pickup of information uh, and the agent that puts it to use and the time when it does so are the same. <laughs> that might sound like a bizarre thing to point out, <laughs> but it's really very important. It's philosophically deep. I mean, you, you've got this bacteria that's got a magnet in it and you've got this bacteria that swims in a certain direction and they're the same one, right? Nature could have come up with something where, you know, there are pairs of bacteria a mile apart. 
And this bacteria has a magnet, and that determines which way this bacteria goes. But they wouldn't have lasted very long because it's a dumb idea, right? You want the very same bacteria that's got the magnet in it to swim north. And how do you manage that? Well, you have a large database. No, it's this, just the same organism. It affect, it's the causation between the way the magnet points and the way the thing swims uh, uh, is just as a result of the construction, the design, the architecture of the bacteria. And so similarly, uh, you could have come up with a, uh, a bacteria, you know, that the, the magnet points north Tuesday at noon, and so Thursday at 5, the bacteria swims in the direction the magnet pointed Tuesday at noon. It wouldn't have survived very long. Well, maybe it would have, I don't know, but it's a dumb idea. Why would you do that? You want it to swim at the very same time that the magnet points. So these roles, being the agent whose magnet points north, and being the agent that is thereby caused to swim north, are what I call linked, architecturally. And the same with the time. Uh, here's, here's another exam. These are chickens. I grew up with lots of chickens. I think I know chickens pretty well, but to defend myself against being a philosopher tending to be a scientist, I will say that I'm engaged in what Bryce calls creature construction. I am constructing conceptual chickens that are based on regular chickens, uh, but I get to say exactly how they work. And if regular chickens don't work that way, that's their problem. So. As far as I can see, chickens spend a great deal of their time walking around the barnyard, and when they see a kernel of something edible, millet or corn, they peck. That's about it. They can see a rooster, they, if it's a hen, and sees a rooster, probably runs the other way. They're a little more sophisticated than that. So I call these proto-chickens. That's all proto-chickens do. No, that's not right. That's not what I call proto-chickens. That's what I call regular chickens. Proto-chickens are even more primitive. Proto-chickens don't have any eyes. They just wander around the barnyard pecking. And every so often, there's a kernel where they peck. If there's enough, if it's a kernel-rich environment, they'll do fine. But it's not a very good strategy. So nature gave regular chickens an additional leg up, right, perception. So instead of just pecking all the time, they wander around until they see a kernel, then they peck. Then they get nutrition. And it's worked pretty well um, for, for many years. Not only for chickens, but for those of us who eat them. So I'm calling my chicken Gertrude. And I will say the perceptual state that Gertrude is in represents the property of being in such and such an environment. Uh, such and such may define various subject-object roles, like being the kernel of corn the chicken sees, or being the rooster from which a shy hen flees. By and large, those roles won't be involved much in what I go on to say. Well, maybe they will, I forget. Now, I don't know what I, S content, that must be S content, not SO content. This is terrible terminology. Please send me an email making suggestions. The S content of Gertrude's perception, that is, we're filling in the role, the animal here that's, we've got an episode of perceiving and pecking. Well, we have two episodes, the perceiving and the pecking. We're looking at the perceiving. The subject is Gertrude, so we filled in the ES role. The time is whenever you want it to be, so we filled in another ES role. And we're saying, what else does the world have to be like for that episode to be veridical case of perception, given that it's happening to Gertrude now? Well, there has to be an edible kernel in front of her at that time. Now, when we look at the pecking, we don't have veridicality conditions, we have success conditions. Given the function of pecking in the life of chickens, which is to get nutrition, what are the success conditions for a peck? 
you have to be very careful these days discussing issues of chickens and pecking for reasons Stacy will now figure out. Because <laughs> um, you want to say the chicken who does the pecking, not the pecker. That's my point. This is just a gift to, to young people that may want to get into this field of, of chickenology. Uh, well, what are the success conditions? The success conditions are that there is a kernel of corn in front of the chicken that does the pecking at the time of the pecking. Now, given that the time of the pecking, given the causal structure of a chicken's brain, which you can scrape out with your fingernail, it's not very substantial, uh, uh, the, the perception immediately leads to the pecking. To the extent that's not true, I deal with only nearsighted chickens who, who don't see distant kernels and go to them. My Gricean chickens are nearsighted chickens. They just see, peck. So there's a, a same role linkage you saw in, in, with the bacteria. The chicken that does the seeing is the chicken that does the pecking, and the time at which the chicken who sees pecks is the same, same time as the chicken, as the time that the chicken who pecks sees. Now, that in itself doesn't ensure that it's going to work. In addition, you need constraints, that is, the way the world works, which you may want to think of as facts about nearby possible worlds. I myself would prefer to think of them as just facts about the way the world, the world, or reality, if you don't believe in the world, works. And the way reality works, most barnyards if there's a kernel of corn there, there will be one there an instant later. Right? So the way the chicken works, the way barnyards work, the way corn works, the way the chicken's nutritional system works, it's a really good system. Right? Just like magneto taxes. So that is if, if you're a teleosemanticist or whatever it's called, uh, you, that's what you think is the birth of content, the birth of meaning, the birth of representation, the birth of veridicality, the birth of truth. The key is really not perception, the key is action. We could get our whole apparatus working with just that proto-chicken that had no perception at all, because we would have success conditions. That is, the success conditions of the act give us a way of describing the act in terms not of what's going on inside the chicken, but in terms of what's going on in the world about the chicken. The chicken's peck is an attempt to eat a kernel of corn. That's its success condition. Its success circumstance, the circumstances in which it will meet its success condition, are that there's a kernel of corn in front of the chicken. Sometimes there's not. Intentionality. Uh, action is the basis of all intentionality. Information processing is in the service of action. That's the fundamental picture I have of, of teleosemantics. Now, Dretzky wrote a lot about this very well. Uh, this is from Naturalizing the Mind. It's his way of looking at it. He says, look, the fundamental idea is that a system S represents a property F if and only S has the function of indicating, providing information about the F of a certain domain of objects. So his, his primary relation is indication of a property. I, I think he's, he's got, his theory is a little bit not quite right or needs some working out when it comes, though, to objects. Dretsky realizes that, uh, well, I should back up a little. So Dretsky's picture is, uh, it, it has to do with information. So a state contains information about another state if there's a correlation. In particular, a state contains information about the environment that causes that state uh, if there's a high correlation between certain kinds of environments and certain kinds of states. So in the case of the chicken, uh, you think that there's some kind of perceptual state that is highly correlated with there being an edible kernel in front of the chicken. 
So, so the state indicates that environment. But of course, the state of the chicken's eyes may indicate a lot of other things, and may be highly correlated with a lot of other things, uh, like perhaps the, uh, the, uh, the makeup of the sun. Uh, maybe just from the way the chicken's eyes work, uh, a scientist could, uh, could tell you a lot about the way the sun works or something. Uh, but in addition, there's the function. That is, what action is driven by the information? And the infer among the things that are indicated, the one that's picked out as being represented is the one that makes sense of the actions caused. So in the case of the chicken, you say, well, the chicken's uh, perceptual state when it sees a kernel of corn indicates a lot of things, but what it represents is that there is a kernel of corn in front of the chicken because that's the thing indicated that makes sense of the action caused. And the same with the, uh, and, and similarly with the, uh, with the bacteria. So we've got this function in there. The function of the state is to drive action. Action that will succeed in the indicated environment. In the environment, it is the function of the state to indicate. And it, I mean, this is, this is an idea that we use all the time in technology. A, uh, a mousetrap, for example. The movement of the, of, of the cheese pedal indicates in a properly controlled environment, that is, you don't put it in the middle of the living room floor, in which case it will just indicate that your toe is there. You don't put it where your dog can get at it. You don't put it where your cat can get it. You slide it in along the refrigerator where only mice can get it. And in that circumstance, in that environment, if that pedal moves, there's a high correlation with there being a mouse there. That indicated in that, that movement that indicates the presence of a mouse is by a very clever information processing system, namely a rod that holds a spring, uh, activates the spring because when the pedal moves, the rod drops, the spring snaps. If the snap is the right distance, it will kill the mouse. Beautiful technology, but the same basic idea. Indication, causation, success conditions. If you make the trap too big, you scare the mice. If you make the trap too small, you hit the mouse's tail, but don't kill it, et cetera, so forth and so on. And Dretzky sees that properties alone won't give us truth or veridicality conditions. Uh, uh, so, so, so he, he, likes, he likes to use uh, uh, instruments. Let's so say a speedometer, the arrow points to 60, so it indicates 60 kilometers per hour. You've got a property that's indicated, but you don't have any veridicality until you've got an object that either is or isn't going 60 miles per hour, presumably the car in which the speedometer sits. But you, to get a proposition, you need an object as well as a property. And what he says that I don't think is totally satisfactory. Experiences are day ray modes of representation. What determines a reference for a day ray mode of representation is a certain causal or contextual, contextual relation I will designate with C. That's not much of a theory. Um, so let's look a little more closely at uh, uh, the kind of uh, example Dretzky likes, a meat thermometer, which we talked a little bit uh, about yesterday. So I'm thinking of a meat thermometer shaped like a spike with a large round head. Uh, the pointer points at a number. The number gives you degrees Fahrenheit, because I don't know what degrees Celsius chickens cook at, but I think at least 160. That would be a little on the low side to eat your chicken, but definitely higher than 161. So an episode E consists of the pointer pointing at a numeral on the dial while the spike into the thermometer is stuck in a hunk of meat. We're going to call the hunk of meat Gertrude, which is the same chicken we had earlier. Uh, I think that's rather crass of me, but I didn't have time to change it once I realized I was eating the same chicken that I had used in my earlier example. So, and we're going to call the thermometer Fred after Dretzky. So Fred now shows that Gertrude has reached 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So the ES roles we have in this way of looking at it, and there's a certain flexibility here, as we'll see in a minute. Because after all, content is not this 
mysterious platonic heaven stuff that it, it's just a way of organizing our account of information flow and the way language works and the way thought works. So the ESO, there's a thermometer, the value of that is Fred. There's the time, we'll just call that now. There's the meat, we're calling that Gertrude. And there's the numeral, which is the numeral 160. Then the SO roles are being the time, right? Um, now you might have a sophisticated meat thermometer that tells you what temperature the meat will be at five minutes from now. That could be very useful. Might be pretty hard to figure out how to do it. But in that case, the SO roll would be different. It would be uh, T plus five minutes. So you could say, ah, well, it says it'll be ready in five minutes. And the meat here is Gertrude. The SO roll is being Gertrude. You can imagine a different system. Maybe, but I don't know why you would. <laughs> Maybe you're dealing with some radioactive meat. And so you don't want to stick the thermometer directly in the meat. So you just stick it in Gertrude. And at the same time, you put the radioactive meat in a different oven. And then, but never mind. We'll, we'll just deal with a simple meat thermometer. And the numeral 160 indicates 160 degrees Fahrenheit. But we could look at it in a different way that suggests that meat thermometers have self-knowledge of a rather primitive sort. <laughs> you might say, well, look, so the, 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 what does the episode consist of? You've got the thermometer and the time and the numeral. And if it's a paradigm case, you'll also have a hunk of meat, but, but that's really not, not, doesn't need to be considered one of the ES roles. And in that case, <clears throat> what the numeral indicates won't, won't be that something is 160 degrees. It will be that something is stuck into something that is 160 degrees. So now the numeral indicates a property of the thermometer being stuck into something that is 160 degrees. Right? And you say, well, now we're crediting the thermometer with self-knowledge. It knows of itself that it's stuck into something that's 160 degrees. Well, knowledge is a kind of a funny word to use for that. But it's self-informative. The pointer on the dial, you can think of it as giving you information about the chicken, which it surely does. Or you can think of it as giving you information about the meat thermometer itself, that it's stuck into something of that temperature. Right. Similarly, you could think of Gertrude as getting information about a kernel of corn or getting information about herself, that she is such that there's a kernel of corn in front of her. Uh, and for different, different degrees of sophistication, you may want uh, one or both of those. If you've got a chicken that tracks kernels of corn, or if your enterprise as a scientist is maybe to put down kernels of corn of different colors that you keep track of, then you may want to set up the thing so that you can keep track of the kernel of corn and not just the property of there being a kernel of corn in front of Gertrude. So my point is there's a certain flexibility here. But there's one way of looking at it in which we can say, well, the, the meat thermometer has some primitive precursor of self-knowledge. And that's the way I look at it. So just to review, we've got e-content. Uh, this is, uh, this is lo looking at it in the first way that the meat of E has reached the temperature indicated by the numeral of E at the time of E. So that, we haven't identified any of the occupants of the ES roles, but that's just a statement of how this kind of thermometer works. Whereas the kind of thermometer you might sell in Europe would be different because uh, the indicating relation would be different uh, because it wouldn't be Fahrenheit. And the S content is that Gertrude, that is you fill in that Gertrude is the, is the Hunk of meat has reached the temperature indicated by 160 as of now. The O content, Fred, now shows that Gertrude is 160 degrees Fahrenheit now. Now, remember, the content is just the part after the that clause. Fred isn't part of the content on this way of looking at it. Gertrude is part of the content, but not Fred. If you look at it as a self-knowledge model, then Fred is part of the content, but Gertrude isn't. Jeez. This guy wrote a lot about meat thermometers. Um, 
Oh, this is the second way of looking at it. Okay, Fred now shows that it is stuck into meat that now has reached 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you need both nows if you think about it, because it's, it's, it's a fact of the representing structure that they're identical. We could have that meat thermometer that tells you what the meat's going to be at in five minutes. Uh, now the O content is that Fred is stuck into meat that has reached 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So now Fred is not only the occupant of an ES role, but part of the O content. And the point of looking at it like this uh, is that you can say, look, you've got two things in the O content. You've got, you got the property of being 160 degrees of containing, of being stuck into something that's 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And you've got that property rather than saying the property being stuck into something that's 150 degrees Fahrenheit or the property being stuck into something that's 190 degrees Fahrenheit because of a variable part of the representation, representation the pointer. So the differences among those, that family of properties is articulated by the way the system works. And then the other thing you have in the O content is Fred itself being the thermometer that has the property. But that's not something that's articulated in the way the, the, the thermometer works. It's just automatic, as it is with the chicken and the bacteria. right? The thermometer that is the one involved in the episode is the one whose property is indicated by the varying aspect of the representation in the episode. So my picture is the representation isn't just the property. The representation gives you a whole structure of an object having a certain relationship to the episode having the property involved in the episode. Gretzky's way of looking at it is a little simple. Uh, and, and just saying there's a relation C isn't exploiting all the structure that his cases really provide. Because the structure of the case really just doesn't say there's something in the context whose temperature is being measured. It, the structure of the episode will tell you exactly how the property indicated and the object of which it's indicated are related to the episode. Or it may give you two alternatives. If you choose the property to be the temperature, then it's the chicken. If you choose the property to be being stuck into a thing of a certain chicken, then it's the thermometer itself. Now, poor Gertrude, before we cooked her, same thing. She's in a perceptual state S, which indicates that there's an object in front of her and it's an edible kernel. The information is harnessed. Harness means that there's a structure where the indicated property has a function of causing action. Gertrude primitively knows, I, so that's what I'm going to call it in the case of animals and humans, primitive knowledge. Primitive knowledge is the kind of knowledge we have just in virtue of perception of the various sorts I listed about our environment and ourselves. Now, another notion that's useful here is epistemic and pragmatic roles. An object plays an epistemic role in our life if it's in some relationship that, such that there's ways of knowing about things that are in that relationship. Uh, so the object in one's mouth, you can find out about by tasting it. Uh, and you, uh, there's also a pragmatic role. You can spit it out if it doesn't taste very good. Uh, the object in front of one, you can look at it if you want to hit it. It's easy to hit the object in front of you, not always too wise. And we all have normally self-informative ways of knowing, intero, those things I said, preoperceptions, and certain kinds of extraception. For example, if I look at my tie, there's a way of seeing your own tie. It's not a way of seeing someone else's tie. I can't see anyone else's tie because I'm the only one here wearing a tie. So that's not very helpful for my example, but at any rate, we will return to the issue of ties. So here's a famous example that I return to a lot. If you've read my stuff, you're sick of this example. Too bad. Uh, Mach tells us that he gets on a bus in Vienna. It's a crowded bus. He gets on the back of the bus, or the tram, I think, a tram. And in, in, in those days, and, and still in many uh, places where trams are used, there are big mirrors. They have them on cable cars in San Francisco. 
So the, when it's crowded, the conductor is at the front, can look in the mirror at the back and see who's getting on and off and make sure that everybody that gets on has a ticket. And Mach sees himself as he gets on the back, he sees himself in the mirror in front, but he doesn't realize it. He just thinks he sees somebody else, and he thinks, what a shabby pedagogue that man is. Presumably because he's got lint all over his tie and his hair's all mussed up and so forth. And then after a while, he really realizes, I am a shabby pedagogue. And those, again, are two, two quite different beliefs, but they have the same O content. So to get at the differences, we have to look at S content. Uh, uh, the first is true if there is someone who plays a that man role, and that man is a shabby pedagogue at the time Mach saw him. And the second, if there's someone who's identical with Mach, who's a shabby pedagogue at that time. Same O content, different S content, different cognitive significance. Um, <clears throat> so now we, have, now we have our problem that we started this lecture with. So Mach realizes that he is Mach. So to have that realization, according to this thing, uh, he has to have some way of thinking of Mach uh, that fits into the uh, I subject-object role, but how's he going to think of Mach? It, I mean, it's not enough to think of Mach as the shabby pedagogue. That's not going to give the right result. You could think of Mach as I or ich, uh, but even if you go back and forth between English and German, it doesn't help you. Um, so what's going on there? Uh, well, <laughs> Let's go back to chickens and animals. Uh, there's a, it's called a mirror recognition test, uh, introduced by a psychologist George Gallup in the 60s or early 70s. It's a fact that some animals, if you put them in front of a mirror, will eventually use the mirror image as a way of getting information about themselves. If you take a chimpanzee and you smear some stuff on the chimpanzee's head while it's anesthetized or in some subtle way so it doesn't realize what's happening, uh, then put the chimpanzee in front of the mirror. If it's had little experience with mirrors, it will rub the stuff off its head. That is, it will engage in exactly the same uh, self-affecting actions that it would if it had felt you put the stuff on its head in the first place. Or if the stuff on its head itched. Right? So a non-self-informative way about finding out about a chimp with stuff on its head leads, after a little experience with mirrors, into self-affecting action of the very same sort that would have been caused by a self-informative way of knowing of the same situation. That's passing the mirror test. Uh, quite a few animals, but a very small proportion of animals, pass the mirror test. Uh, chimpanzees, some other simians, some aquatic animals, the ones you'd expect, the, you know, dolphins and whales, that kind of thing. <laughs> I have my, never myself performed a mirror test with a whale, uh, <laughs> but I'll take somebody's word that somebody did. Uh, some birds, chickens, no. My expectation was that chickens would not pass the mirror test, so I did some careful research by spending three or four minutes on Wikipedia, or on the, the net, and I found in a website devoted to the issue of whether putting, uh, I mean, if you've got animals in your barnyard and you want to keep them happy because you're, you know, you're kind of a free-range chicken kind of person, how about putting a mirror in the coop? Will that make them happy? Because it, it might with some other animals, like if you raise chimpanzees. Uh, well, no, it doesn't make chickens happy. It just makes them frustrated, right? They just start pecking at the chicken in the mirror. Pretty soon they break the mirror, and that's dangerous. So it is not a good idea to put mirrors in your chicken coop. And that's from the, that's from the web, so I don't suppose it. But let's imagine a, a chicken that did pass the mirror test. So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to take Gertrude, and we're going to put a kernel in front of her, but we're going to put it behind a little slanted thing so she can't see the kernel in front of her. But when she looks in the mirror, she'll see the kernel in front of that chicken. Now, the real Gertrude won't do anything except maybe attack the chicken and try to peck the kernel out of the mirror. But we're imagining Gertrude, after a while, actually passes the mirror test. So she 
she looks at the chicken in the mirror, thinks for a while, and then pecks and gets the kernel of corn, even though perceptually she couldn't quite see it because of some clever thing you did. What happened? Well, <laughs> to have what I call primitive self-knowledge, you don't need to have an articulated representation of yourself that you combine with the property, say, of having a kernel of corn in front and thereby are in a state that is true if and only if you have a kernel of corn in front of you and that therefore is appropriate to cause the pecking. You don't need that. You just need a state that as a whole is veridical if there's a kernel of corn in front of you. But in order, now, so you can imagine intermediate stage, Gertrude goes around and she sees other chickens with kernels of corn in front of them. And maybe her behavior uh, actually depends on which chicken has the kernel of corn in front of it, the big mean chicken or the little wimpy chicken. If the little wimpy chicken, she'll charge and eat the kernel of corn herself. If it's the big tough chicken, she'll not do that. We could imagine Gertrude. So now Gertrude does seem to have the conceptual equipment to say property ch kernel of corn in front of X, and then X, the wimpy chicken, the strong chicken, causes appropriate behavior depending on the total truth conditions. Wimpy chicken has kernel of corn in front of it. Charge, not so wimpy chicken has kernel of corn in front of it. Don't charge. And it's very tempting to suppose that she's applying to herself, when she sees the kernel of corn, the same property she's applying to the wimpy or the non-wimpy chicken when she sees them. But if she can't pass the mirror test, you want to have, you want to say, well, maybe not quite. Maybe these are just kind of two separate systems in her head. She has this holistic way of knowing when they're, primitively knowing when there's a kernel of corn in front of her, uh, she has a more articulated way of registering when there's a kernel of corn in front of another chicken, but she doesn't, as it were, see herself as one chicken among others that may or may not have this property. On the other hand, if she does pass the mirror test, then you're somewhat inclined to say no. She's gone beyond the original Gertrude, and she is now, as I would use the term, self-attributing the same property that she attributes to the other chickens. And that's why I don't like Lewis's use of the term self-attribution, which I think is very misleading because it sounds like that's what's going on when what I think he actually has to have in mind is primitive self-knowledge where that isn't what's going on. So anyway. Uh, now Mach passed the mirror test. And what happens when you pass the mirror test is, 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 is something uh, we, we can call a logic of articulation. So when I look at my watch and it says 10.15, <laughs> I guess I was a little optimistic when I did the slides, uh, assume I always reliably keep my watch set to the time zone I'm in. We call this Central European time. Okay. So when I see 10.15, I say to my wife, who I just called, oh, she says, what in the world are you doing calling me? And I say, well, it's, it's 10.15. Ooh, it's 10.15, Central European time. So I have articulated Right? I've gone from, from something whose vertical conditions include the time zone it's in, but it doesn't articulate anything about the time zone it's in. And I've added the information that I just recalled, ah, that the relevant time zone is Central European time, which I sent it to, and that that's quite different from Pacific Daylight time, uh, which uh, it would be about 1.15 p.m., and she would be pissed. And I say, I'm sorry about that. So uh, that's the logic of articulation. You find a lot about it in Heidegger. I just thought I would throw that out to see. Uh, <laughs> so when you're lost in hammering, see, you don't, you don't think about it's you hammering. But when you step back, then you articulate that it's you hammering. And I think this was actually based on his uh, bad experiences with time zones. Ha ha. No? No laugh at that. Uh, now, <clears throat> you get up in the morning, you look outside, and you have unarticulated knowledge, primitive knowledge. 
the same sort of knowledge that the chicken has or the child has or humans had for thousands of years before they came up with the idea of days. You say, it's nice outside. Well, forget about the tents. That's going to it nice outside, I guess. That's the way they talked for years before tents was invented. Right, Robin? Do I have that right? Yeah. Robin has a book on, uh, on, on early, early uh, the development of tents in Aboriginal humans. An unpublished monograph. Uh, then I, I, I articulate, even if I don't know what day it is and where I am, you know, maybe I've been traveling so much, I've forgotten what day it is. And I, am I in Budapest? I'm in Dynastia? Am I in Paris? Am I in Nome? I don't know what day it is. But it's nice outside. Ergo, it's nice outside here now. I've articulated those parameters. And then if I recognize, ah, it's nice outside October 3rd in Dynastia. So there's a logic of adding parameters, but the point is that you don't need an articulated way to, of thinking of the day and time in question to get started. You just need to have primitive knowledge of those factors. Uh, and there's also a logic of dearticulation. I don't suppose you have farmer's almanacs in Europe, do you? Maybe you do, but in America we have farmer's almanacs. And they're very good. They give you the weather for every day of the coming year so you can decide what to do with your crops. And that's always exactly right. So I look in the Farmer's Al Almanac and it says, October 3rd, 2014, nice day in Dynastia. I don't actually think our Farmer's Almanacs cover Dynastia. <coughs> and uh, I realize it's October 3rd and I'm in Dynastia, so I leave it articulated, but I go to a way of thinking that feeds right in to the episode relative roles. It's nice here today. And then I completely dearticulate and get myself into the kind of primitive state of expectation that humans had for thousands of years before they started having dates and days <laughs> and say, it's nice outside. It will be nice when I go outside. So. <coughs> So that's the end, I guess. So to, to go back to the beginning, um, the idea is we solve this severe problem for the picture I have, and therefore, and also say something interesting about self-knowledge and the problem of the elusive self uh, by saying, uh, when we think about ourself as ourself, or when we think about the day as today, or we think about now as now, it's not that we have some special mode of presentation of an articulated sort uh, that we use to get at the person we are the time it is. It's rather that uh, we, uh, we have the uh, ability to pool information got in unarticulated, normally self-informative, no, normally now informative ways with articulated pools of information that we use for different purposes because we live complex human lives in which we have different ways of finding out about ourselves. You, Kepa can find out when he's supposed to be teaching by looking in the course schedule. I can find out when I'm supposed to give the talk by looking on the internet, the same way you would find out when I'm supposed to give the talk. Uh, I can find out uh, about October 3rd by looking in the Farmer's Almanac or by looking at my, my Google calendar, say, oh, I'm supposed to give a lecture today. Uh, so, so the apparatus of, of uh, articulated subject-object roles uh, is a sophisticated way of dealing with things that we don't need articulated subject-object roles to deal with when we have primitive self-knowledge, primitive knowledge about the environment, and so forth and so on. And recognition doesn't mean coming up with some very special sort of articulated way of thinking about those things, but rather forming a bond, a cognitive connection, so that we pool the information we get in uh, non-articulated ways with the information that we get in articulated ways. And so, thank you very much.